So this evening, Books and Books is very happy to present Professor John L. Mills and his new book, Privacy in the New Media Age. And here to introduce Professor Mills, we have a very special guest. He is the New York Times bestselling author of numerous thrillers and a great friend of Books and Books. Please welcome to the podium, Mr. James Grappando. Thank you. And thank you all for coming out to Books and Books tonight and supporting what I think is the greatest bookstore in America. And every time I go on tour for another, yeah, absolutely. Um, when I started writing novels uh, 20 years ago, um, I was practicing for a very large law firm in Miami called Steele, Hector and & Davis. And I made one rule for myself, which was to keep it a secret because I didn't want my partners to think I was looking for a way out of the practice of law. And I pretty much succeeded in doing that. I wrote a novel over a period of four years. Um, and when I announced to the firm that I um, was getting the book published by HarperCollins, everyone was pretty much taken by surprise. Uh, I don't think I could pull that off in today's world. Uh, when we hear about things going viral and keeping secrets uh, and one slip of the tongue to the wrong person results in everything being exposed. And that's the world that we live in today and that John writes about uh, in privacy in the new media age. Um, I first met John in Gainesville uh, when I was a student there and he was running for public office. Uh, I was a student. Uh, we would come in and report to him and tell him how great we were about getting out the vote among students, and then he would ask us, well, you are, sh are you sure they're actually registered to vote? <laughs> Minor detail. Um, but uh, he went on to be Speaker of the House, uh, and from the very beginning, John was always one of these very forward-thinking people, um, which is what made me want to work for him uh, as a student on his campaign. Um, everything from uh, Child Abuse Prevention Act to the amendment to the Florida Constitution guaranteeing privacy from government intrusion. John was behind those kinds of things. Um, I point that out because I want everyone to understand that, uh, no pun intended, but he's not a Johnny come lightly to the issue of privacy. This is something that he has studied and thought about for many years. Um, he is the distinguished Dean Emeritus of the University of Florida College of Law. Um, he's lectured all over the world on constitutional issues. And his pre previous work, I know to, I hope they have his previous book here tonight, um, was just um, masterfully done, uh, Privacy, the Lost Right. Um, you might insert the words, the voluntarily <laughs> lost right in there, because we're all giving up our privacy, uh, which is one of the things that John writes about. Um, He's now counsel at the law firm of uh, Boys, Schiller, and Flexner, which is David Boys' law firm, which Jennifer in the audience is also a partner there. I'm of counsel there, along with John. Um, so uh, it's a great group of people, uh, and John is one of the true stars at the firm. Um, all of this is my way of saying that this is an important book that has been written, and in my view, it's written by the person most qualified to write it. Um, you know, some people might say that the most vexing issue presented by cyberspace is identity theft. Um, I think it's identity or reputation destruction. Uh, and John puts it this way, this is the question I think we all face, is can society protect those who are harassed, stalked, and misrepresented online while maintaining our constitutional freedoms. Uh, there's a lot of who we are as Americans embedded in that question. And John's book, um, which I hope you will all buy and read, uh, doesn't answer all those questions, but he has framed the issues uh, certainly in a way uh, that I think no one else before him has uh, in this book. Um, and he's also has some really interesting case studies, which maybe we'll hear about tonight. Um, and I can't wait to hear about it. So let's, uh, I'll turn it over to John now. And thank you all for coming. And 
please, please read this book. It's an essential reading. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. It's a pleasure to be at the best bookstore in, by the way, the best city. Uh, you, can, you can do that. I was born in Coral Gables. I can say that. And I went to Coral Gables High. No, the, some, so it's a, it's a pleasure. It's a very much a pleasure to be back and see a lot of, a lot of friends here. Uh, and <clears throat> be introduced by Jim Grupando is special. Uh, yeah, well, of course, he got me elected in 1978, and he was only, I think, 10 years old at the time. Uh, and a special guy, and it's one of those occasions that Books and Books must be very happy about, because the person who's introducing the presenter will probably sell more books than the guy who's presenting. You know, it's good to have, uh, good to have Jim here. Uh, well, this, this topic is pretty vexing and deals with, with all of us, because we all care about our identity. Now, uh, what I'd like you to think about is what the next page. Technology, technology. <laughs> now, privacy, what do we, what comes to your mind when you think about privacy? These these kinds of words now, they're, they're general and they're conceptual. And then I want you to stop for a minute and say, okay, I, as an individual, there's some things about me that I don't want other people to know. And if there's anybody who doesn't have that, I want to meet them. There are probably a couple things that you hold that's, that are part of you that you don't want people to know. Now, there are also things that may invade your privacy that may be just a, a flat-out lie about you. And one of the things I need to think about is, which would you be more concerned about, the truth or the lie? I'd be more concerned about the truth. <laughs> so the question is, what is the world we're dealing in today in terms of media? Now, we care about media. Free speech, freedom, truth, accountability, expression, media is a watchdog, dirty laundry, expose, uh, dirty laundry. Does anybody know, remember Don Henley's song in 1982? Dirty laundry, all about the media. Say it such things as, uh, we all know that crap is king. Uh, is the head dead yet? It's interesting when people die. 1982. Ain't hey, nothing compared to today. Now, what are bad things that happen in the media when things go wrong? Like dirty laundry, misappropriation, you get embarrassed, it's defamatory, viral. Paparazzi, gossip. Hey, a lot of things are gossip now. Uh, there was a person who once said that the American media is personal, acts without principle, and without preparation. Now, was that a recent person dealing with the paparazzi? No, that was de Tocqueville in 1840. So the media today didn't invent being irresponsible. There's a capacity to be irresponsible even in previous times without all the things that facilitate it. Now, one of the things that uh, Jim alluded to is, is I got interested in this case because of some very personal experiences. Uh, in 1990 in Gainesville, there was a serial killer named Danny Rawling who killed six students. Uh, it was brutal. Uh, the uh, crime scenes were torture scenes, and there were, of course, pictures of autopsies. And media wanted access. I was asked to represent pro bono uh, the, the victims of that, to try to keep it from being published in the media. We were, we were successful, barely. Uh, and it was a new theory. But you were actually balancing the interests 
the interest of those parents, those victims, parents who couldn't imagine what it would be like to have the pictures of their children exposed. I couldn't either. Uh, I had to see those pictures. No one wants to see those pictures. So the judge said, it's more intrusive to release those pictures on balance with the public interest. So that's it's a good start. A number of years later, uh, the Earn you may remember when Dale Earnhardt died, the last lap of the Daytona 500. Uh, I was asked by his family to address that. Uh, within two days, it could have become public, his autopsy photos. Same set of questions, but the players had changed. There were now websites, death.com, others that would have instantly published those photos. So the newer the media got, the more dangerous this became, because I don't think the New York Times or anybody was going to publish those photos from the Rowling case. They weren't going to do that. They were fighting for some principle. Now you had people who really wanted it. Uh, and Dale Earnhardt was a famous man, and he could afford uh, his family could afford to defend that. The next case that came up to me was not a famous family. Uh, the woman who died at SeaWorld. You may recall that. She, tra she tragically died. She was a, a, uh, a trainer. There was a video of her death. There was a video of her death. And the media wanted it. Again, not the New York Times. Not the Miami Herald, not the Chicago Tribune, but somebody wanted it. And you can know that in that year, that would have been posted. And that could be interpreted as nothing more than a snuff video. It's awful. Now, so that's the perspective I, I come to this from. That there's, there needs to be a balance and that the new media is not the Miami Herald, the New York Times, or they have not received grants from the Knight Foundation. <laughs> now, technology is important to this because what's changed is the capacity to collect information is incrementally different. Whether that's done by a search, whether it's done with a telephoto lens, telephoto lens is nothing compared to other technology available. Whether it's done with a drone. <laughs> well, now we know Amazon's going to be delivering things with the drones. Now that's going to be just really interesting. Uh, what, if, what, if, what if you're not there? What if you are there? What if, now, the drones, by the way, uh, the technology on that, you may know, the drones, no, drones can be now the size of bees. So the technology is, uh, out, has an outrageous effect on gathering information, has an outrageous effect on disseminating information. The internet didn't exist. How much, how much could somebody publish who was a little wacky? Now, they're global. The other aspect of technology is it's global. You cross borders instantly. You have the ability to disseminate things worldwide. And who knows what's next? I mean, there's GPS. There's, there, there, there are hundreds of ways to intrude and gather information about an individual. And what's different? Old media. I was talking to Alec from the uh, Knight Foundation today. People in a newsroom, editors, counsel, people talk to each other. Maybe something doesn't get published that shouldn't be published. Maybe somebody says that's defamatory, don't do it. That's the new media, one guy at a computer. Now, he didn't look very sinister, by the way. There's some really good sinister pictures <laughs> should probably use. Uh, but we don't know who's there. And that's another aspect, uh, is the anonymity. 
that this, these, these technologies facilitate. Who is it that's making that statement about me? I don't know. And for me to obtain the information about who wrote it is a real challenge because frequently uh, they're not going to tell you. <laughs> the people that are the, the website that it's published on, they're not going to tell you because they feel they have a responsibility to protect uh, the, the anonymity of the people involved. Now, I'm going to give you three examples of uh, intrusion. Now, does anybody remember Shirley Sherrod? She was a um, assistant secretary, I think, in the Department of Agriculture. Uh, she was giving a speech to the N NAACP. Uh, Mr. Breitbart, who runs a, I guess one could consider it, uh, what was a conservative blog, excerpted her 45-minute speech into two minutes. And if you, if you looked at the two-minute speech, you would be completely convinced that she was a racist uh, that was discriminating against white farmers. That achieved the goal. Then something interesting happened. That was in the morning. <coughs> By mid-morning, CNN had covered it. By late mid-morning, Fox had covered it. Then the New York Times put it on its website. By mid-afternoon, the NAACP had condemned her. By the way, there were some people who knew it was completely false. Uh, by late afternoon, she'd been fired. By late afternoon the next day, everybody apologized. It's completely inaccurate. So this represents another aspect of what's happening here that makes it difficult to preserve our, our dignity and our privacy, and that is speed. Media, you don't want to be the one who didn't report the story. It happened. It's a story. It's big. Did they fact check it? Clearly not. And 24 hours later, she's lost her job. She's, her reputation has been badly damaged. Now, there's another aspect of this you think about, and Jim is absolutely right. I do not have the answers to all these questions. So we know the original person was misleading and probably defamatory and had intent. All the damage came after that. Any of those people republish have any liability at all under the First Amendment. It was a public statement. They republished it. They republished the fact that it was happened, that it had happened. It's, it's very difficult. Now, some of these, some of the discussion in this uh, that we talk about, the EU and other countries will take more of a balancing approach between privacy and dignity, uh, between free speech and dignity. We in the United States clearly have balanced the scales in favor of free speech. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. That's, the, the, the democracy is based on that. But at some point, when you're the person in the crosshairs, when you're the individual who's actually been wronged, there ought to be a remedy somewhere. Now, this is great. So my research assistant said, I would like a picture of you next to this. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, for those of you who can't, well, thank you very much, Alec. He's going to go. Uh, so, F1 boss has sick Nazi orgy with five hookers. So, that is, of course, news of the world uh, in the very subtle uh, Great Britain area. Uh, I also noticed Hannah Montana's on this, so a few years ago. So, uh, this is a true story, Max Mosley, uh, well, I say a true story. <laughs> there are certain parts of this are true. <laughs> and he, he sued. And by the way, here's part of the paradox. Uh, once he sued, it became a bigger story. So, it's sort of the plaintiff's paradox. You say, uh, okay, this is wrong, so I'm going to sue. 
So now it's page one and page one and page one again. So Max Mosley was a significant public figure, uh, Formula One racing, uh, and so all of that makes sense. Now, his first objection was, you'll love this, the response. It was not Nazi. What about the rest? <laughs> <laughs> hmm, okay. So, and by the way, that worked pr pretty well for him uh, in, in Great Britain. You know, uh, they, so he got 60,000 uh, pounds. And the fact that the rest of it may have been true, <laughs> don't call him a Nazi. That's <clears throat> now, there, there are a couple of messages that are associated with all of these, and I want to come back to that. You know, what, what do we learn from this? Well, what do we learn from this? Now, um, there is a case pending in New York right now. Uh, this is about a art show called The Neighbors. This photographer took a series of pictures through people's back windows. Said so this was honoring the analysis of Hitchcock's rear window. So it was artistic. So he took a number of pictures without consent, without knowledge. By the way, if you can see, this woman is pregnant. Not that that's intrusive. But the people who did sue, uh, he had taken a picture through the rear window and two of his young children were dancing and partially clothed. Now, is that intrusive? So, this current status of this case is they lost. Judge said it's artistic, artistic expression, First Amendment, freedom. We bend over backwards. So, what did we learn from these three cases, briefly? From Shirley Sherrod, speed, instantaneous dissemination of information, and what, the vulnerability of the mainstream media to just copy what's been put out by bloggers, even that were intentionally misleading. What did we learn from Max Mosley? Well, be careful who you invite to your house, <clears throat> because that was, an, uh, that was an internal video. So that must have been very interesting. And remember, the factual argument was saying, well, uh, I don't see any Nazi paraphernalia. So we, we won't go into any further detail. But that was his house. <laughs> and people were inside it. And if they would have been accurate, no problem. Remember, accurate and intrusive is a big problem. Because in the United States, we say if it's accurate, you can say it. What do we learn from the neighbors? I think it's a mistake. <laughs> I think the case is wrong. Uh, I hope they change it uh, on appeal. Uh, I have to say that this was a very interesting conversation I had with some people who were in New York. They said, they should have, they should have closed their windows. <laughs> they should have closed their windows. And this, uh, it, 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 that also kind of represents the privacy of locale because you talk to people in a lot of different places, and that's completely outrageous. You're, not gonna, you're taking pictures through somebody's window with a telephoto lens. <laughs> New York, well, yeah, I mean, if you're sitting there in front of your window with 50 other apartments. So I don't know, what's the takeaway of that? Uh, don't live in New York or, uh, or shut your window. <laughs> Two different options or change the law. Now, the, one of the overall problems with this 
we discussed, and I'm going to be glad to answer questions, is the problem with the law and technology. We're, we, the law, and my friend Professor Frumpkin and my, my colleagues at Bar here, we're always behind. I mean, that's what we do. We look at precedent. So technology is always going to be ahead. And we're, lo we're losing. But the principles are the same. The principles about caring, about dignity and privacy and individuality. Now, okay, this is a question. Who deserves the most sympathy? All those in favor of Shirley Sherrod, raise your hand. Ooh, okay, a lot of Shirley Sherrods. I report to those watching. Oh, sympathy for Max Mosley. Ooh, one or two. <laughs> I was wondering who was going to raise their hand. <clears throat> we'll want to point that out later and invade, either invade their privacy or find out where they're going after this. Uh, and the neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> So there's a lot of sympathy for the neighbors, too. Uh, I, I think what this represents is there, there's some reason to sympathize with either, any, all of them uh, for different reasons. And the law is in, in deep trouble trying to catch up with, with the, the current reality. Now, you leave this with, you know, this is not good. You know. as, a, as an abstraction, we're, we're good with all this. When it gets personal, it's a problem. Uh, but actually, I think they're hopeful. They're hopeful signs. Uh, you may recall that uh, Justice Roberts, in an opinion recently dealing with search and seizure, said you cannot search somebody's smartphone without a warrant. And that, in fact, a search of that smartphone would be more intrusive than a walking through that person's home. How does that strike you? Maybe true. Maybe true. What do you have on a smartphone? Everything about you. Location, who your friends are, who you called, maybe your finances, everything in one place. That's a new reality. So there is some hope. So what do we do about that? Well, we kind of do what the people in the Rollin case and in the Earnhardt case and in the Branshaw case did we have to stand up because there have to be margins. There has to be a point at which we'll say that's intrusive and we're going to have to go and take aggressive action in the courts to define that margin. Otherwise, the things we care about, dignity, our personal liberty, are going to continue to be eroded. So let's do it. Thank you. So I am glad to respond to questions. Yes, sir. I'm wondering if there is or if there should be a difference in the perpetrator of invasiveness between a government and just a, a person. You mean if government is the invader? That's a great question. You know, and one of the things um, that I frequently ask, ask folks, and I think about those, those personal facts, uh, those things that, that, that you, you hold dearly, what would make you more nervous for the NSA to have it, for Macy's to have it and give you a discount, uh, or for, for a blogger, or for, as someone said, my last bad boyfriend? To my last bad boyfriend. <laughs> so it's interesting um, that the, uh, we got to assume the NSA has got a lot of information. I don't assume that they do. <laughs> uh, so they're not in the business of disseminating it. But it's very clear that people are more fearful of government because government can do things other people can't do, like put you in jail. So we rightfully... Uh, have concerns about government and rightfully should be concerned about their invasions and there should be limits. 
and there seems to be more attention being paid to that at the moment. But it's, uh, the interesting thing is we may be harmed just as much by private individuals uh, or maybe more. You know, NASA is probably not going to tell anybody about it. Of course, they may just come and arrest you, but that's question. Thanks. Professor Funk. I was, I was curious in your discussion of the neighbors, whether you're more, your intuitions, you're more offended by the taking of the picture or the publishing of the picture. Because most of you talked about was the publishing. And of course, traditionally in tort law, the, the intrusion is the, the taking of the picture. Now, my, my intuitions are very different from yours. I'm trying to understand where you're coming from. Well, I, th I think both. Now, the, what Michael's talking about is we have an intrusion upon seclusion tort, which means if I am doing something to reach into your personal space, whether it's a wiretap or a video or a photograph, it doesn't even matter whether you ever publish it, right? That's your, your point. The, fa the fact is the intrusion occurred. And that is a very defensible legal principle. And conceptually, you'll have a better time suing for the intrusion than you will for the publication. I don't actually think there was an intrusion. Well, okay. Well, you're from New York, so that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there is, uh, but there's a case in Mississippi that does the same thing. <laughs> the, there, there are two things going on. One is the actual intrusion. Uh, which could be electronic. Uh, if somebody actually personally walks in there, uh, then that's a, a personal intrusion. But is, is somebody who publishes that guilty of a public disclosure of private facts, which is the other tort, which is very difficult to prove in the United States if something's true. And then taking that a step further uh, or, or relating it to revenge porn, Somebody is publishing, publishing something to harm uh, that other person intentionally, and there are statutes that deal with that. Now, you're going to have to prove they intended to, <laughs> which is hard, and that they were harmed. And then there's a whole separate industry that's gathering the revenge porn pictures and putting them on a website. Is that, is that okay? I mean, it's third party. It was out there. Is that a public disclosure of private facts? It's a First Amendment question. Jim. <laughs> One of the things you talk about in the book is how the law is sometimes trailing behind the technology, both of the reporting and the news gathering part of it. And I, I think of things like, you know, retractions, you know, is, is which in many states, you're excused from liability if you issue a retraction. And it, that just seems like such an archaic thing to me anymore. Is it, 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 and where is the law on, the, on that now in the, in the new, new media, uh, where nothing ever really disappears? Is there such a thing as a retraction? Well, I mean, sure. Those, the, I think those, those laws still exist. You can print a retraction, but does it matter? Uh, the... the uh, the people at the New York Times with Shirley Sherrod, does it matter? There's a, the, this is information as a commodity and an intrusive and valuable item. The information about you is valuable. What's particularly difficult is the comparison <clears throat> to the fact we're used to, com we're, we're used to protecting other kinds of property. We know how to do that. If you steal my car and take it to the mall, leave the keys in it. Somebody else takes it, drives it. I can still get the car back. <laughs> now, if you take some information of mine and post it anonymously on the web, and somebody else comes and takes it, can I get it back? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Am I, it, so these old remedies of getting stuff back that's worth definable uh, amounts and it's the tangible property having a tough time saying that this information may be more a lot more valuable <laughs> than the tangible item but when it's gone what do you do and 
it's very difficult without figuring out a way to punish somebody. <laughs> if the, if it, it, and if it's the person who knowingly takes something that they know has been stolen and uses it, maybe. If there has been a knowing, there, there's a case for all the, the Bartnicki case, professor, <laughs> uh, that dealt with a radio station publishing uh, a broadcast of, uh, that was, that was uh, problematic, intrusive, etc. And it was obtained illegally through a wiretap. They didn't sue the people who wiretapped. They sued the radio station, radio station one, <laughs> because it was a public interest. <laughs> uh, it dealt with an education uh, policy issue where there were actually threats in, the, in, the, in that audio. So it was a public interest. And uh, the Supreme Court said, unless the radio station or the media is directly connected and knows of the wrongdoing, they can do it because we weigh the public interest outweighs uh, the wiretap. By the way, there's a, th a theory that went right, Justice Rehnquist <laughs> writing the dissent, not known as a wild-eyed liberal, said that when we think about the First Amendment and free speech, we should think about the people that are being impaired <laughs> who are recorded, pretty good thought. You know, that if, if I'm at risk for everything, is it gonna impair my conduct? Am I gonna be afraid to speak? Is it in fact chilling free speech? So the First Amendment could cut <clears throat> both ways in this. Yes? Victor? Any questions? We're still, still time left for questions or comments? Oh, over there. I have one. Uh, as a takeaway from here, what are the sorts of things, sort of prescriptive policies that we should be seeking to advocate or seeking to have legislators change? Because the law is something that is always going to be behind. What are certain things that maybe our legislators could do? One example was uh, the Florida legislature passed a revenge porn statute. We, we, we seem to be capable of doing some narrowly targeted things. Uh, that is uh, revenge porn. Uh, we targeted uh, video voyeurism. We can target uh, bullying online. Uh, for those of you with a really good memory, uh, you realize that your rental of videos is protected by statute. Oh, you don't rent videos anymore? Because there are no video stores. <laughs> but that was uh, during another era. And we, we in the United States can target very specific things. So we kind of have to do that. But there also is this litigation edge, which, is, which worked in a couple of these cases, like Earnhardt and others would say, on balance in these particular, case, in these particular cases, the intrusiveness far outweighs the value. And that is not a strange concept in Europe. I mean, the EU does that. So you could identify a case in the United States and a case in the EU with precisely the same facts that would be decided differently. There's one I'll, I'll mention quickly. Um, in San Francisco, uh, a person was uh, in a gay rights parade. It was a number of years ago. And he didn't particularly want to, uh, that to be known generally. There was a picture of him that was placed in the newspaper. He litigated. He lost. Virtually identical set of circumstances in France. An individual was in uh, a parade. Name was being reported and they decided he had, he had determined that he wanted information available to certain people, but not everybody. And that on balance, there was not, not enough of a gain 
from the public knowledge to justify the intrusion. Would we have, the United States would never do that. So uh, I don't know uh, how, which direction we move. One of the issues here, and an important discussion from the point of view of the Knight Foundation and others, is the ethical perspective of the media. The media may usefully police themselves, start to talk about what uh, is the right thing to do, what kind of training they expect to give, and that true outliers here would be identified by the media. And they're still responsible and important principles that the media should adhere to internally. So. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Bob. All right, folks, so if there are no more questions, then a note to our internet audience watching at home. Still plenty of time for you to get a copy of the book shipped to you wherever you are in the US free of charge. For those of you here in the house, we have the book for sale at the counter in the room over there. Uh, Professor Mills is going to be signing over there at the table to the left of the screen. There's still plenty of uh, food and drink back there at the reception. I would like to thank our guest introducer, James Grappando. And please give a hand to our guest, Professor John Mills. Thanks very much. Thank you.